I don't want to ruin your day, uh, but there are only 209 shopping days until Christmas. I first realized Christmas shopping was a big deal back when some people uh, wanted Cabbage Patch Kids. Does anybody remember Cabbage Patch Kids back in the, like the 80s? Yeah. I was pretty young, but it seemed like everyone wanted one and none of the stores had them. And as soon as they had them, something like this would, would break out as pandemonium. You'd hear about people getting into fights over a Cabbage Patch Kid. And I get that their head smelled really good like a real baby. But at the same time, it just seemed like it was, it was crazy that the stores would get stocked for a few they had. And it just seemed crazy to me that so many people want, just had to have a Cabbage Patch doll. In recent years, there's been other things if it wasn't Cabbage Patch Kids. Or there was Bugle Boy jeans, I remember it was a big deal. Then Tickle Me Elmo, if you remember, that was a big deal. Nintendo Wii, I remember standing in line for a Nintendo Wii. You had electronic picture frames, remember when those were all the rave? Like everyone wanted to have those, and you might still have them. And then HD TVs became, became kind of the, the big shopping thing where people have stood in line for and fought for their chance to make Christmas merry for somebody else. Now, to see the pictures and videos of people making a mad dash once the door opens on Black Friday is pretty startling as we see chaos on full display. Because despite all of the planning of the stores, the reality that presents itself is full of disorder and confusion, or simply put, chaos. But chaos isn't limited to just crazy shopping habits leading up to Christmas, is it? Have you ever observed Christmas? What about, have you ever said that the place that you work is kind of like chaotic? <laughs> or maybe the place where you go to school is chaotic. Or maybe there's just a flurry of activity. Or maybe there's someone's desk. That despite what they say, they, they say they know where everything is. That you look at it and see, this looks like chaos to me. Now, chaos can seem to be, if not present in our lives at the time, at least a, only just a couple bad breaks away from coming into our life, doesn't it? What about other things in life? Driving a car. Everything's fine until it isn't, right? Then it can get chaotic pretty fast. Living in a community. Raising a family, learning at school, all of those things are just a couple things away from chaos. I think nothing will give you false confidence like having one kid and moving... Well, okay, let's be honest. I was the best version of a parent when I had no kids. I knew everything there was to know about parenting. I knew what everybody was doing wrong. I knew what they should be doing. And I knew when I had kids what I was going to do, and I was going to do it right. Then I had a kid, or I didn't have one. I got to, my wife had one, God bless her. And then I was like, I didn't know anything. <laughs> and then you have a kid, and, and they're just, you know, a little angel. And you're like, this isn't, that, this, you know, it took some learning, but, like, we got it. And then the second one comes, and you're like, we don't got anything. We, we thought we knew what was going on. And we had that, again, false confidence. Chaos breaks out. And the first one, or the second one's so different than the first one. We're like, what in the world were we thinking? It, they tricked us. But many things work until they don't. Some things work because someone has brought order to potential chaos, whether there's a teacher in a classroom, a police officer to a situation, a homeowner's association to let you know what, what you're on the verge of going into chaos, or simply agreed upon behavior. Chaos is often kept at bay as long as everything goes as planned and as long as everyone plays by the rules. But take one unexpected situation, one renegade who ignores the rules, or just one wild child, and we quickly can feel that we're at the center of chaos. It's in this chaos, when things feel out of order and, and become confusing to us, that we can often be reminded just how little control we actually have. In all honesty, the world and the universe around us are much too big and powerful and unruly for me to take the reins. And that realization can kind of bring two things, I think, in our mind. First, it can be overwhelming. For me, it can become overwhelming as I question my own ability and even my purpose and my role as things just seem completely out of my control. Two, it can be a reminder that it's not my job, it's not my purpose or my role to take the reins or play sheriff for the world and the universe. Why? 
Because God is already working against the chaos, cutting through the confusion, bringing order, and making all things new through Jesus Christ. And rather than be caught up in the first realization of my own futility, I want to encourage you, all of us, to be reminded of the second realization. And that's God's ability, demonstrated in what He has done, what He currently is doing, and what He has promised to do. And as we're reminded of that again, let us live out of a response to that. And that response is worship through our life. Worship can be defined as an adoring regard or focus towards God. And as we look in the Psalms today, Psalm 24 and Psalm 122, we are not only reminded of Jesus' words in John 4 where he says, True worshipers do so in spirit and in truth, but we are also reminded of Genesis 1 in the beginning and Revelation 21, which is the completion. And so that's just kind of a snapshot of where we're going. We begin today in Psalm 24, beginning in the first verse And here's what it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Now the writer of this psalm begins by reminding the reader of who created the world and who created all that live in the world. We didn't create it. We may be impressed with ourselves at times. But the writer invites us instead to be impressed with the one who started it all. And that's God. Then in verse 2, we are reminded of creation as the writer talks about the seas and the waters or the rivers, depending on the translation that you use. And this is a nod, a direct nod to Genesis chapter 1, specifically verse 2. And here's what we read in Genesis. It says, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of waters. So this is the setting beforehand. This is in the, in the Hebrew and the understanding of the Jewish mind when this was written, water generally represented chaos, especially in this form. And so just before God continues, you have chaos. You have darkness hiding everything and deep waters without any order. But God's spirit hovers above the chaos. And in verse 3, God acts. Then God said, and light comes, revealing what's there. God pronounces day and night, providing order. Then the water is given boundaries, and land or dry ground is created, keeping back all the things of chaos. Psalm 24, as it begins, is a call to remember that there was chaos, but then God came and established order. Verse 3 says this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now the writer here is asking, who may then come into this God's presence that's done so much? Who can come and enjoy the rest and the peace of God's dwelling place? He then answers his own question. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. The one who does not trust in an idol. Who can enjoy rest and peace? The one who has come to the second realization we talked before. The one who recognizes that God is the one who brings order, fighting against the chaos. The one who recognizes who is responsible for all creation. The one who doesn't just play the part, but worships God with mind, body, and soul. Clean hands points to our deeds, where a pure heart is talking about our why or our motivation for what we do. What it's getting at, I think, here and the reader is getting at is saying, do we do what we do out of love for God or do we do it out of duty or out of gratitude and service? Do we love God to show kind of what we did? We're saying, hey, God, look what I did. I I did this really for you. I think a lot of times we do. We say, God, look what I did. And God's saying, yeah, but I'm looking at your heart. I'm looking at your intentions. Did we form an attitude of worship, affectionate gratitude when we were in the middle of doing it? Or was it because we feel like if we did something, then God's going to owe us, like it's a quid pro quo? Do we want to do the dishes or do we not want to make him mad? There's a scene from a movie, and and I'm not going to talk about the movie because I'm not endorsing the movie. And you probably never saw it anyway, so don't worry about it. But (laughs) there's a scene from a movie where a husband and a wife both come home from a busy day. They both worked, and they host friends for dinner. 
And after the last friend leaves, the door shuts, and the wife says goodbye, and she shuts the door. She turns around and walks in and finds the husband reclined on the couch in front of the TV playing a video game. And she says, I'm going to go do the dishes. And he says, okay, cool. And so she says, well, it would be nice if you helped. And he said, you know what? I really had a long day at work. I would like to just relax and let my food digest here on the couch. Just, just leave the dishes until tomorrow. And she says, come on, let's, let's just clean them now. I, I, it'll take 15 minutes. I, I don't like to wake up to dirty dishes. And he says, who cares? And she said, I care. I worked all day too. Then I cleaned the house and I made dinner. It would be nice if you said thank you and help me with the, dish, with the dishes. Now he gives this huge eye roll and lets out a big sigh and he tosses his controller over to the side and says, fine, I'll help you with the dishes. And she said, no, that's not what I want. And he said, are you crazy? You just told me that you wanted me to do the dishes. And she said, I want you to want to do the dishes. He said, why would I ever want to do dishes? She said, because you know that I don't like to wake up to a messy kitchen. I tell you all of that because clean hands in the situation are clean dishes. A pure heart is wanting to do them out of love for the spouse, not because they're just simply dirty. And so what I believe is that would, that would kind of put a, paint a picture of what is worshiping with integrity. When what is done is an outward action of an inward focus of saying, man, I love this person so much and out comes me washing dishes. I hate dishes, but I love that person. Next, the writer in our psalm says, uh, the one who does not trust an idol. Now, if you spend too much time in and around the church, you've heard all about idols. These are false gods, and they can be gods like the first audience that was reading this at the time, like Baal. They can also be anything that we put faith in to give us what only God can. That's an idol, right? Anything that we trust that God is supposed to give us, that can be an idol. It could be money, it could be possessions, it could be status, it could be relationships, it could be another person, but it usually boils down to the power to bring order and a perception of control over the chaos of life, right? We feel safe, we feel settled, we like to put up certain things, have certain things in order so we can feel like, okay, at least this corner of my universe is under my control. But the psalmist says, the one who does not trust other things than God are the ones who find rest and peace in him. He continues then in verse 5. It says, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Those who worship God in both what they do and in the reason for doing what they do is worshiping in truth and with integrity. Those who are finding the blessing to be his presence. That's what he's speaking of here. We continue on in verse 7. It says, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord almighty. He is the king of glory. So the writer is, I mean, he said it a lot there, didn't he? King of glory. I mean, I, don't, I didn't count how many times. I'm not sure if I can count that high without taking my shoes off. But he said king of glory a lot there. He repeats it again and again. The call is to remember who deserves our worship, who deserves our focus. The call to prepare and to focus on the king of glory. The focus on the creator of everything. To focus on the one who brings order from chaos and clarity in the midst of confusion. The king of glory who is powerful. Not any idol, not any person or any other thing, but God, the king of of glory. These same themes are echoed in Psalm 122. We read that, it says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stands the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. There's a celebration that's going on in this passage. And it's time to go and praise God, is what the writer is saying. To go into God's presence and be reminded of who He is, what He has done and what He, is, what he will do as God, creator of everything that is still creating to this day. 
Those thrones of judgment that he mentions there, that bring justice instead of letting injustice run wild, is another instance of order over chaos. Again and again, God brings order over chaos. It is established by God. And what is the fruit of order through justice? Verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, Peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. I believe the author is saying here, rest and security in the presence of God are prayed for, resulting from the order established by God. Where there is justice, there is order and there is peace. When there is peace, there is rest. When you aren't constantly worried about what tomorrow will bring, when you continually aren't caught up and worried that you'll have to figure it all out when tomorrow gets here, or you'll have to all make it work by yourself, and instead put your faith in God's ability to be God, then He gives you rest for your mind and your heart to say, you know what? God's got this. Now, it doesn't mean we stick our head in the sand and say, nothing's going on, all is fine. But it means we don't have to worry about how it's all going to work out. We don't have to worry about the details. We don't have to worry about how this is all going to happen because we know that at the end of the day, God is on the throne. He is going to bring it to fruition. If he has said it, then it will happen. The reason many of us aren't able to worship, I think, more than just sing a couple songs, if we're even able to do that, is because we have lost sight of the boundless possibilities of what God can do tomorrow. We lose our sense of the possibility, our sense of creativity and imagination. Instead of marveling at all that God might do, we forget that that this God who created the universe is still powerful and still at work. Sometimes we get in our head, that was for them back then, as if God somehow died. But he didn't. He is still powerful and he is still at work. Now, it might not always look the way we think it will, But that doesn't mean he's not working. We may not be able to see everything with our eyes and we're looking around saying, God, what are you doing here? But we know that he is at work. I think a lot of times we think that the world in general and our world specifically is being overtaken by chaos. And that every day will be exactly the same or worse than the day before it. Are all the good days and the best days behind us? Or is God simply leading us into different days? That's the question we need to wrestle with. Because so many times we get caught up in like, oh, if things could just go back to how they were. They're not. Unless you find Doc Brown and a DeLorean in a lightning storm, you're not going to travel back in time. And the idea that God does is he doesn't, how, how often does he go back and make things like they were? No, he just does a new iteration of it. It's different. But it's still God. A lot of times we're saying, God, we want you to do the exact same way. And he's saying, I'm doing something new. Can't you see it? Do you remember a commercial? It had to be 80s or 90s. And it was a McDonald's commercial. And it was a person. And they said, get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. And it showed them hitting their alarm. Get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. It was like, you know, they got caught up in just the grind of every day looking the same. And the commercial would say, get up, go to work, get McDonald's. Like that somehow made life so much better. And then <laughs> come home and go to bed. That's the idea that not every day is going to look the same. And so the God that created the world, the God whose spirit hovered over the chaos of darkness and the deep, only to bring light, land, and life, is still at work to bring light and life today. And so yesterday doesn't have to be forever. Today doesn't have to be forever. There is hope for a better tomorrow and that things are getting better by Jesus Christ, even if we can't see it with our eyes because we can believe it because he's doing it in our hearts. And that's the foretaste. You know, like when you go to Costco, I don't know if any of you go to Costco or other places, and they have all those samples. You know, my kids love that. Sometimes if, you, if you're really creative at it, you don't even have to go out to dinner or something. You can just go to Costco and keep hopping around. <laughs> now, there are things there like, you know, wheat germ and some other stuff that you're like, ooh, I don't know if I'm going to eat that. But anyway, uh, that's a foretaste of something bigger, isn't it? They're giving you a foretaste, a sampling of what that is. And so what you know and what Jesus has done in your life and in your heart, that's a foretaste of what he's going to do to the world. What's going to come about? And so when we invite God into our lives, when we position our lives to live in response to that truth 
And in the flow of that spirit, then we are working with the King of glory as we worship him with our life. We are inviting him into our life and accepting his invitation to partner with him in what he is doing. And what is he doing? In case we forgot, we got Revelation 21 to get excited about. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, no more sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. That's what he's up to. We can't see it sometimes. We can look around and say, what's happened to our country? What's happened to our neighborhood? What's happened to our family? And he's saying, hold on, I got this. I am still on the throne because worship isn't just singing a song. It is living in awe of all that God has done, all that God is doing, and all that God said he will do. Some will tell you it doesn't make sense. There's too much going on. Life is too complex. There are too many things threatening to send your life into absolute chaos. But worship is placing your trust and even your life in the hands of the one that you know is winning against the perceived chaos. And when you do that, it frees you to rest and enjoy the blessing of life now while eagerly anticipating of what God will do next. Does it all of a sudden fix everything around you? You all of a sudden have every bill paid and, you know, don't have to work for anything and you're in the best health ever? No. I mean, that might, I mean, if it happens to you, God bless you. But it usually doesn't work that way. But God will come and make you better. Each and every day, more like his son, Jesus Christ, if you surrender to him. And you can rest in that. You don't have to scratch and claw like peace and rest are the latest iteration of the Cabbage Patch Kids. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to strive for it. You have to just invite him into your life and know that he's got it under control. Instead, I would encourage you and all of us to remember who created it all, to remember who brought order from chaos, and remember who is making all things new. Remember all that he has done, and let that give you hope that the same God that has done something in the past is going to do something in the future. Tomorrow doesn't have to look like yesterday or even today. God didn't bring you this far just to leave you here. If you have breath in your lungs, then God isn't through with you yet. It might not look like it did 20 years ago, but God is still going to be there and do things in you and through you. That's why we don't live in the past. We remember the past. We can celebrate all that was good and say, thank you, God, for that time. We can grieve the not so good. We can learn from what happened, but we focus with hopeful anticipation on what can happen next with God. Focus on Jesus. Let's worship him with our lives. Let's live the truth that he's got under control and find rest in his Holy Spirit. Then you'll find that he has peace for you, a peace that fights back the chaos and goes beyond all understanding. The Prince of Peace has come. He's invited you into a relationship through him. I encourage all of us to do that, to just join him. And sometimes people can say, man, is there anything else to it? Well, yeah. Allow him to be your savior and allow him to be your Lord. And you'll never have a boring day the rest of your life. But you also don't have to worry about how it's all going to shake out. Because we read about it in Revelation. And sometimes people want to know all about the details and when it's going to happen and how this is going to happen and how that's going to happen. And, and, and I'm not saying those things aren't important. I just know the important thing is that he's coming back and he's going to make all things new through his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. How it happens, he, God's got the details. I don't need a chart to figure that out. I've got God and he's got me. And you do too. We're thankful for